name is Mike Langford. Welcome to the Augmented Advisor Podcast, brought to you by Blue Leaf. This week on the show, John Prendergast and I are joined by Theodora Lau and Bradley Limer, co-authors of Beyond Good, How Technology is Leading a Purpose-Driven Business Revolution. Theo and Bradley are also co-founders of Unconventional Ventures, a boutique consulting firm that helps companies drive innovation that improves financial wellness. We invited them on the show because the concepts of financial wellness, inclusivity, equity, and sustainability are really important for our industry. At first, one might be prone to just shrug these things off as soft, everyone needs a hug type topics. But when you think about it, what the Beyond Good thesis is all about is growing our industry by widening and deepening our pool of potential clients. Sounds awesome, right? You are going to love it. I promise. Trust me. Keep listening. Before we get started, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Amazon, the YouTubes, or wherever you like to get your podcast jam on. And if you have a question or a suggestion for a topic or guest for the show, please feel free to reach out. Just swing by blueleaf.com, use that little contact form, or hit us up on the socials. You can find Blue Leaf, John, and myself on LinkedIn and Twitter and many more social networks. Just look for us. We're super duper easy to find. Okay. Let's get to our conversation with Theo Lau and Bradley Limer. Well, Theo Lau, Bradley Limer, John Prendergast, welcome to the Augmented Advisor Podcast. Great to see you this morning. Thank you for having us. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, dun, dun, dun. we, we had a little know. bit of a joke, yeah, the dun, 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 the dark side. So, you know, one of the things we were doing in, in our prep call, I always like to ask, like, how do you, do you prefer Brad or Bradley or when and you said, well, I'm going with Bradley and I've, I've gone over to the dark side. And then Theo showed up and all her Star Wars glory was behind her. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing because, you know, above me, for those who are watching behind me. Uh, I have a custom print of the Millennium Falcon there, and I have all my Star Wars swag uh, around the office, and Theo's office is really decked out. And then John, uh, May the 4th birthday, so it was like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. So um, I thought we'd kick things off with a little Star Wars stuff. Which, go ahead, John. The force is strong with this group. <laughs> yes, I should have come with my Darth Vader mask. <laughs> That's right. I had a, I have a, 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 a stormtrooper helmet, and I was really tempted to fire up the microphone with the helmet on today and just uh, kind of throw everybody by surprise. Uh, Were you worried that people who are watching the podcast did ask you to keep doing that though? Yeah, <laughs> it's just like Mike. We prefer. <laughs> <laughs> the visual is better with the helmet, right? <laughs> it would be fantastic. Uh, well, given, uh, given our collective uh, love of Star Wars, I thought it would be fun to kick uh, things off with a kind of a nod to episode four, A New Hope. It, reading the book and spending time uh, on the Unconventional Ventures website, uh, it's really easy to see that you kind of have a, a calling to fight the dark side, despite Bradley's... Uh, proclamation that his, his name is dark side ish. Uh, when you think about writing a book, it takes an incredible amount of effort, uh, blood, sweat and tears type stuff. What made you to decide that beyond good needed to be written? How much time do you have? Mike? <laughs> <laughs> We're just rolling. We got unlimited. So, well, <laughs> make a long story short. Um, you know, I'll kick this off, and Brad, I know that you have a lot to, to add on to. Um, we have been writing for a while. Um, you know, we have a weekly blog that we post along to with our weekly episodes of, of podcast on One Vision, where we interview different entrepreneurs from around the world and want to use our platform to tell their stories. And so after a little while, we were like, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of materials in here. Perhaps we can stitch together a story. And uh, at the same time, a publisher in the UK approached us and um, said, they, hey, would you guys like to write a book? And voila, everything happened. It was like a perfect storm, if you will. That's the, yeah, perfect, that's the, uh, yeah. That, that's, that's the official that's, version of that's it. That's the official version of it, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say, you know, we've been writing since probably 2017, 2018. And, um, you know, in those years, we developed, I think, a cohesion around this idea that things could be better. Mm -hmm. Things can, you know, sort of break the mold. 
of the business model for financial services across the board. And to, to witness, you know, firsthand a decade of sort of fintech disruption and not to talk about it and not to have an opinion about it and not to propagate those companies that were doing right, I think uh, would have been something that we would have looked back and neglected uh, our life's mission. <laughs> and, and that's why I think the book came out and we're talking about Beyond Good, the book that we came out yeah. in March. Yeah. yeah. And I think I'll add to it too. Sometimes, you know, as a nut to, to the whole Star Wars reference, uh, Mike and John, that you guys started off with, I would treat a lot of, of the fintech startups that we've come across as Ewoks because <laughs> it's, 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 uh. so bear with me a second. I know right. that, you know, recently there is like nonstop funding news. Every morning you wake up, there's like almost feels like another unicorn is born. Uh, but if you take a step back and you look at it, a lot of these companies, they're all doing the same thing. They're all serving a very minuscule segment of the market. They are trying to build mini replicas of, of the old world, if you will. But then if you look behind the scenes, there are these little new companies that are starting up that are focused more on communities, that are focused more on purpose, that are focusing on more trying to go beyond what these big giant behemoths are doing. And collectively, I think eventually we will be able to get through all the mess that we have and, and get to a, a brighter side, a new hope, if you will. But um, that, that, that's what gives us hope is beyond all the loud noises. Who else is doing amazing things? What can we do to lift their voices up? Well, it's interesting, Theo, because that's, that's really one of the key themes in the book, right? Is this this call for businesses, particularly financial services, to create more inclusive business models um, and expand access to those services really to a much broader segment of the market, sort of what you referenced. And I know for us, that lines up with Blue Leaf's mission to 10x the capacity of wealth ma management, really in order to expand access, right, to high quality financial advice. But I'm curious, you know, can you talk a little bit about why wealth managers should care about expanding access? <laughs> well, f first off, I think, um, you know, that's one of the themes we touched on is the world is changing around us, right? So if you continue the current model that you have, if you keep serving the clients that you have, your pie actually ends up getting smaller and smaller because there's such a massive opportunity out there. So many more people that are not well served so many people that do not yet have a financial advisor, but yet have a little bit of assets that they need help with, right? So we have the technology for us to be able to branch out to do more. We have the ability to reach out to more people and think of more inclusive solutions. So why not? You're leaving money on the table, right? So it's not just the right thing to do. It's also enlightened self-interest, it sounds like. Yeah, that, that's the one thing we, we, we stress upon is doing good doesn't mean that you end up in a charity, right? Doing good doesn't mean that, you know, it's philanthropy. There is money to be made to, to do good, and there's purpose and profits that can and should coexist. Yeah, and, and I would just add that I, I, don't, I don't understand the concept of, you know, not caring about people that are living on $2 a day or that only have $10,000 for the retirement after 50 years of working. I, I don't, you know, understand why we wouldn't want to provide more access to everyone to, to build their savings and build their wealth and to have access to the same types of services and tools that people that are sort of in this one to 10% of income earners in any particular society. And so, you know, when, when we look at the community and we look at the way that financial services and wealth management and savings and investing and these types of things have changed. We've gone from, you know, think about 30 years ago, stockbrokers sort of controlling a lot of this relationship, and you had financial advisors, sure, and you had insurance brokers and all the rest. But then technology came into the mix. And then in the last 10 to 15 years, you've seen this sort of huge change in the way that we trade stocks, have access to investments, have access to fractional shares, have access to, you know, this ability to get into the system at a low to no cost. And, and that, you know, I, I would think would scare traditional wealth managers and their business model because, sure, there's more people getting rich in this economy and there's more millionaires and all the rest. That's, that's wonderful for them. 
But what about the rest of the people that on average have $130,000, you know, on, on their entire 40, 50 years of working for retirement? That's, that's not enough to live on. And so, you know, we should all collectively do what we can to sort of increase that number, increase the number of people that are looking to build that wealth and improve the quality of, of life in our communities. It's interesting, you know, I can almost hear the, um, and we talked a little bit about this in prep, right? So I can almost hear it, the financial advisor who's listening or, or watching at, at their desk going, that's awesome. And I, I do want other people to do well. It, it's, but, you know, for me and my business model, this is a challenge, right? Like, so I, I earn money by managing assets under management. If somebody has that $10,000 or that $130,000, it's not that I'm not unempathetic to them. It's just that I struggle to be a profitable, that, that's a hard time for me to have a profitable business relationship with that person. Uh, how do we help the advisor be able to render advice better for those folks? I think first of all is make your process a little bit more efficient, right? There is a lot of efficiency to be gained, and especially in smaller family offices. Um, so that's where technology, I think, can play a really, really big role um, to allow you to serve more people, right? So that that's one. And but that's a numbers game. I think two is to be able to expand the people that um, are, you know, that that are working with you. That is one thing that we talk a lot about. doesn't matter which industry you're in. People tend to solve problems that they're familiar with, and people tend to associate with people that they are familiar with and comfortable with, right? So you end up with buddies from college starting businesses together. You end up, you know, working together with your friends who think alike. The challenge with that is you end up serving people that look like you, right? And so to be able to expand the reach and serve more people, you need to understand where they come from, you need to understand what are their challenges, and you need people with similar lived experiences that can help you navigate the wider, bigger ecosystem. Mm. And yeah. it sounds a lot like there's also a, a, an ecosystem issue here, right? Where the industry itself, whether you're NAPFA, when we spoke with Greg Brown, who's the CEO there, has a role to play actually in encouraging those people who look different and and understand those different life experiences helping them actually start the business in addition to expanding existing businesses right it's also about new business formation in these underserved pockets yep yep that that's very very true i think there was a stat that came out um recently that talked about for example if we look at Black founders, right? There's a lot of movement or increased awareness that we need to invest more because they're underserved, because there's systemic bias everywhere you look. And yet, despite everything, right, all the efforts, all of the corporates standing up and say, well, you know, we will give more opportunities to underserved founders and communities that we don't typically think about. The amount of venture funding that these black founders get are less than 2%. Right. And so as minuscule compared to everything else that we see across the ecosystem. So, you know, it is a first step because it is the highest in the last five years, but we have ways to go. One of the, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting about the way that the rest non-wealth management part of fintech and financial services is evolving is that you're seeing more community focused banking entities develop, especially over the last year. And we've had a lot of these founders on our podcast as well. And whether it's, you know, the African American community or the Asian community or LGBTQ or immigrants or what have you with these neobanks, what's going to happen, I think, in wealth management is that with the tools and applications and infrastructure that is around building wealth and trading and these types of things, is that, you know, you're going to have to not only worry about the large platforms like a Robinhood, which has an amazing set of growth, you know, almost 20 million users just in the last like year, I think it's gained. You're going to have these sort of neobanks that are offering, you know, traditional banking services, start to offer investments, start to offer crypto trading, starting to offer, you know, ways to build wealth 
ways to continue to build into the community, ways to raise funds. And these advisors are going to simply be on the outside if they're not embracing the entire fabric of the communities that they live in. And so that's, that's what's interesting to me is that a relationship business that theoretically can compete very, very well against digital businesses, in my mind, because if you combine both digital and that personal touch, you could start to scale in a different way. You could start to think about a business model that extends to more than just you know, trading and holding and growing and decumulation. You could think about other services that you could partner with. And that's what's amazing about what's happening to fintech today, is that everything, every business model is sort of being ripped apart. So to, to, to me right now, as, as a wealth advisor, I would think that this would be kind of the most exciting time and also most, you know, the most frightening, terrifying time. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. We love change in this industry. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, it, it, I, I love the way that you, both of you, you know, responded to that because it, it's really true. You know, there's, there's so much opportunity out there to serve markets and, and consumers that just aren't being served well or at all right now. And there's, there's a bunch of you know, more value there than you might suspect on the surface because I think I can't remember what the stat is, but it, it's something ridiculous. Like only like a single digit percentage of Americans have a financial advisor in their life. Mm -hmm. And so that means, guess what? Everywhere you look, more likely than not, you're about to run into somebody who could use your services. And as I was prepping for the show, kind of doing my show notes, I, I had a, another Star Wars uh, parallel there. That, and I just thought, you know, listen, there's a lot of opportunity in the outer rim. For those of you who are familiar with Star Wars, you know, the main character, Luke Skywalker, is living on a desert planet called Tatooine, which is out in the outer rim. Kind of think of it like out in the middle of nowhere. But Luke, it turns out, is really gifted uh, and has a lot of talents. He's a great pilot and so forth. Turns out he's got force powers. He becomes a Jedi. And then you think about the planet itself, despite it being like this desert planet in the middle of nowhere, there's a thriving economy happening there, right? There's lots of business owners doing things and, and so forth. And yes, Star Wars nerds, a lot of them are shady. I know the huts live there, they're criminals. <laughs> but the lesson is, and, and you highlight this really strongly in the book, uh, is that talent is evenly distributed across the Star Wars galaxy and here on Earth. It, yet opportunity isn't. And, and, and that opportunity includes access to financial advisors. We talked in prep about, you know, there are probably many small towns in America who that have like a, maybe a thousand people, 2000 people where there might be one or two financial advisors, maybe. Right. And that could be a problem. And, and that, so uh, what are your thoughts on how advisors can expand their reach beyond their local nexus? Right. So I'm here in Austin, Texas. And if I was going to you know start bringing on clients, I would probably look for people close to me, but I, I don't need to limit myself there. And then I think, I think just as importantly, how can financial firms attract talent, like advisors that aren't just in the big cities? Well, that is, if you can solve that, that is a billion dollar plus. Um, I, I really like, for example, some of the efforts um, by different local governments that are actually trying to build up programs to attract people to come to their places with incentives and also to build a community, you know, taking talent from local schools and, you know, attracting local businesses to help create opportunities. I, I think we need a lot more, right? Just like what you were saying, you know, we can find opportunities everywhere um, if, if you're intentional about looking. So intention is, is one. I think a lot of us have biases based on where we come from. I was born and raised in Hong Kong, so I'm very biased um, with the whole region in Asia on, you know, what is happening out there and, and the talent and, and everything. But I, I, I think it's one is to take a step back and recognize what are you trying to do, right? Who are you, who are you trying to help? What is your purpose of existence? I know that is like a really big question for a Friday, but what, what are you trying to do in here, right? Are you trying to make a big bucks, a few, a few bucks, or are you actually trying to do good, right? And if you're trying to do good, then use technology. Tech is here. Tech will not replace human, but tech can become enablement for you to reach out 
to beyond your local zip code and beyond lo your local city and really truly think about who you're trying to serve and start looking for those people and looking for those opportunities. And, and, and I would just say, you know, in, in the last 18 months, have we not determined that geography doesn't matter with just about anything? Depends you know, on we, which we bank can, you talk to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some of these banks, the big banks are trying to bring everybody back in. But it's like, you know, you're a financial advisor and, you know, I'm going along with the Star Wars theme. Uh, if, if you reach out into a community of Star Wars people and, and you say, look, I'm, hey, I'm a financial advisor. What are you doing for, for saving your, you know, for your retirement and for thinking about, you know, putting away some more here and there? And what do you think about, you know, these kind of tools? And if you combine technology and a connection to any community, it doesn't matter how that community is defined. You define your business by who you collectively collect into it. Mm -hmm. And so when, when an advisor, you know, is thinking about, well, you know, my, my, my clients are sort of, they look like this. Well, what, what's the connection between them? You know, the advisor that I use, I sort of inherited. I think I told you guys this story, but, you know, when my mother passed away about four years ago, she had a financial advisor who was geographically connected to this retirement community that she was around. And, and I was like, I'm not going to keep a financial advisor. I don't need a financial advisor. You know, I know what I'm doing. I'm in fintech. I'm in banking. <laughs> But, but this guy like provided more than just financial stuff. And it was a relationship that we built around, you know, kind of taking care of my mother's assets and all the rest. And what, what's important about, you know, the way that he looks at his business is that it's very much digitally focused, but he's on the ground with a community, but he's also building out his community by reaching out to people and doing Zooms and that kind of stuff to keep connected with not just finance stuff. And that is something that a robo advisor or an application that's on your phone is never going to be able to like unearth because it's not having a conversation with you. So the, the one thing that, you know, combining an advisor and the technology and the infrastructure tools that a lot of these companies are enabling now is that that human element, they're not just wealth building, but life is never going to be replaced by an application or an AI completely because the human element is going to be still very, very much important because life decisions aren't small and they're not single faceted. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to, to reach out to the Star Wars fans to become the number one financial advisor to them. <laughs> I think you just gave yeah. an idea to our audience. Like, listen, somebody's going to corner the market on Star Wars nerds like me. And, <laughs> and, and, and the next like, thing you know, George in. Lucas is a client. You never know. <laughs> well, I think there's a really, honestly, I think there's a brilliant kernel in what you just said, Bradley. And for me, it's that you can automate even narrow aspects of advice, but what you can't automate, what AI is not going to replace is the care that, that a human delivers, right? And, and that's really the, the key thing, right? What, what I hear from that story is that advisor cared beyond a couple of dollars that they were, they were managing. They cared more about your life more completely. And... And that was the thing that dip, that that let that person stick around. And you know, it's interesting. We were talking to a, a friend, Kieran, at McKinsey yesterday, and he was talking about wealth transfer. And he was talking about uh, when husbands die and leave leave money to their spouses. 70% of those relationships don't survive for the financial advisor, mm -hmm. right? Because it, right, even in the existing business, we kind of have an underserved community in term, just thinking about women, right? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's amazing, right? The, the underserved communities are all, literally all around us, but, but it all connects to this idea of the care that can't be replaced by technology. But you could certainly augment the time that you have to deliver that care with the technology. Yep. You know, John, Absolutely. You just... It's the relationship, right? Mm. Um, I, I think I remember hearing from, from someone with a similar stat, and she thought that most of the women, they switch advisor within a year of their spouse um, passing away and because that relationship was never there, right? Exactly. Mm. You never I mean, tried how many times to... is you know, the advisor going in, as I'm talking over you, I feel like I'm like, <laughs> like doing the whole gender <laughs> thing right there. It's like I'm just demonstrating it. <laughs> but, but thank you for that demonstration, Bradley. Like, the, 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 I'm, I'm demonstrating, exactly. 
are, but the advisor is going to come in and not have the relationship with the, the wife in that relationship. And so that's, it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, how, how many times have we seen or even hear stories of, of financial advisors talking to a couple that comes into a meeting and that person only address the male in the household mm -hmm. and just completely ignore the woman that's sitting there? I, I mean, you know, we've seen Absolutely. that, we've experienced it, you know. So if, if you never tried to even attempt to build a relationship with that person, you wonder why the person would take the money and run. And for all of my friends who are advisors, I, I, I can hear the complaints rising right now. But, you know, the, the couple told me that the husband wants to deal with the money. But this idea that Bradley talked about earlier helps you expand the idea of the relationship. It's not just about the money, care about the life. And if you do that, you can develop a, a relationship that's a little distinct with, with the spouse that you wouldn't otherwise have had. And therein is how you how you handle the wealth transfer right uh, it's all about caring a, a, a crux of, of the book is that we say our greatest innovation is our empathy and and to understand that in the context of how financial services is changing is that we can't regardless of how many layers of technology we can't forget that you know at our heart we're human and mm -hmm. our human needs are you know millions of years in the making it's food, water, shelter. We talk about that a lot in the early parts of the book about what you're physically trying to achieve in life is comfort. And, you know, if a financial advisor doesn't quite understand that they have an opportunity to, to build that community, even within the, the, the clients that they have today, then, then they're missing that connection, that human connection that is so critically important. You know, the, I don't know who the revenge of Maslow. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who, who to credit this the uh, the saying to, but it's the old people don't remember what you did; they remember how you made them feel. Uh, so the empathy concept, like if you focus on making the people that you're interacting with feel good. So to the conversation uh, John mentioned with Kieran about widows moving on, you know. If you serve those widows well, chances are they're going to feel good about it and they're going to know other widows at some point in time and they are going to talk. And so when you talk to many advisors, they talk about how much they rely on re referrals to grow their business. It's, it's very, very common to say that that's their number one source of new business. Well, where do you get referrals from? The people who you work with who feel good about working with you. And so if you serve a community well, you're likely to get more of those. It's perfect. I think, you know, a lot of that is trust, right? We talk about human relationships. We talk about, you know, looking beyond just a dollar sign. It's, it's trust. That person that you're working with have to trust that you, you have their best interest in mind, right? And to your point, that trust built on respect. It built on relationship. It builds on empathy, and that's how you can expand your business. And that's not something a digital app can replace. You can't replace that. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I really loved about the book, Theo, was the way that you brought up so many big, important, long-term and global trends that, that have shaped where we are today and are clearly going to shape the future. And there's a couple of them that Mike and I saw that we thought we'd like to dig into a little bit. The, the first one is around some of the technical and business model changes that are really changing the environment. And, you know, you talk about this, this rise of embedded finance, and then that moving to something you termed ambient banking, which I thought was phenomenal. So first, could you talk a little bit about what is embedded finance like conceptually? Well, I think to put it plainly, and, and Brad and Bradley, you can um, add to it definitely. That that's your favorite area. It's it's something that having anyone and everyone, other service providers beyond a bank, to be part of that journey, right? So you think about, for example, Shopify, or you think about IKEA, you think about um, Walmart, you think about um, you know doing things in your daily lives. One of our great 
favorite examples are, again, sorry, looking back out to the Far East, right? You look at Tencent, you look at Alibaba, you look at Gojek and Grab. All of these companies, they all started off with addressing a small and very special needs in the community, right? They think about, you know, um, providing gaming or social media to the users. They think about solving a transportation problem in Southeast Asia. Um, they have an app that help people get taxi rides. These are very specific needs in the society. And then as they started serving them, they started noticing, wait a minute, these people I'm serving that I'm helping with, the micro-entrepreneurs, the drivers, and what have you, they don't have access to financial services, formal financial services, right? They don't have access to microloans to be able to grow their business. They don't have access to wealth management tools because they don't, they fall out of that small circle of, of what people typically think about you're bankable, you're, you know, a, a client that we want to go after and serve. And so these companies, they start offering on top of their original core model, food delivery services, lending services, microloans, um, wealth management services. And we see these models growing in Asia. And this is it. They, none of these guys are banks, right? But they offer banking services for people that are otherwise underserved. And we think that was a brilliant model. Yeah. So it's like, you know, now your dry cleaner is going to be able to provide you ways to invest your money. And, you know, it's, so, so it's any business model enabling a banking relationship, just, oh, by the way, it's like, as part of their checkout process, they're going to be like, oh, well, you want to level up, you know, your, your purchase here, put those 20 cents into, you know, Bitcoin or Dogecoin or whatever it might be, or buy Apple stock whenever you buy Apple product. And you saw just uh, this past week, you know, Apple getting into credit products, more credit products with Goldman Sachs with buy now, pay later. And you, you continue mm -hmm. to see non-financial business models adding credit, investment, savings, day-to-day mm -hmm. -day banking. And we have this whole host of hundreds to now almost thousands of providers that are simply providing the rails behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So any company, any business model is going to be enabling any financial relationship that makes sense tangentially to the customers that they have. Yeah, I think that bundled credit buy now, pay later example is, is is so crystal clear about how embedded in, that can that can be in that relationship. How does that evolve into what you described as ambient banking? So ambient banking is, is sort of when banking goes away. It's this idea that no matter what financial flow is part of your business model, you are going to be able to behind the scenes, know that everything is being sort of routed the way it should be. This idea of automated banking. When, when ambient banking sort of becomes pervasive, it's kind of like now with the way that we use applications and data and it just is sort of our daily life. We don't really think about the fact that we're banking. It just becomes part of the flow of our day. And so, you know, this idea that we could embed banking into other business models becomes so ubiquitous that turning on the television, there's like a piece of financial, you know, banking and savings and whatever within it. It's like everything becomes just automated. And mm. ambient is just, it's background noise. So banking is background noise and everything's sort of done for you. You know, we, we enter into the Wally -E stage, getting into another sort of movie of um, what banking <laughs> might become. You know, we're just going to be cru cruising around in our little, like, you know, platters and um, just <laughs> letting everything around us be done for us. And it's going to be, uh, you know, a, a little bit easier. But the, the challenge still will be, and, and again, going back to the book, is that who is that going to benefit? And how do we ensure that everybody benefits in the same scale, regardless mm. of where they are economically? Mm. It's something that fades in the background. I think that is that is a perfect way to describe it. It's something that you don't think about, right? Mm. Um, or did you guys ever notice that in, in a different movie, not Star Wars, in Star Trek, there's no money exchange hands? Mm. There's no right. credits in so, Star Trek? You know, so will we, will we get to the point where, you know, we, we don't, these things just happen? It, mm. it, we don't even think about it, right? You know, things like, like Rhett say, you know, would it, would it just happen for us? And, and a lot of that's enabled by tech. A lot of that is enabled 
potentially by AI, right? Which is why we're so fascinated by by emerging technology because would we get to a point where the tech around us know us so well that they can automatically make decisions for us? I think we're really far from it, but the data is there, right? I think all of the necessary data elements are there. And I would argue that, you know, between the big tech firms, They probably know more about us than we know about ourselves. They know where we shop. They know how we shop. They know when we shop. They know what mortgages and loans and everything we have outstanding. They know how much money we come in. They know about our family relationships and everything that happened around us. So when we get to a point where we don't have to consciously sit down and think about all of these things on a constant basis or worse, in a static Excel spreadsheet, which a lot of us still use, um, to the point where it just knows what it is that we want to get to and what it is that we need to have happen, who do we need to take care of and what is our life ambitions, and to be able to create that roadmap for us for the future. That would be ideal. And how do you see that playing out in wealth management? And are there any limits to that that you think, you know, humans really still need to do? I mean, certainly we talked about care, but I'm curious how you see it playing out. Imagination is your limitation. <laughs> right? right. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it, if we think about, and, and we talked a little bit about it um, previously, if we think about traditionally how we service clients, we look at a person as your client. You don't typically think about the extended family of relationships you need to care about and think about. But if we see how we have been living our lives, we're not just living longer, we are having more extensions of families with us. We are having more generations of people with us. And as such, life's more complex, right? Mm -hmm. We lived an extra 30 years compared to how it was before. If we have changed the way we work, we have changed the way we earn money, there's no reason why we shouldn't change or we need to change the way we think about saving and spending down and drawing down our money. All aspects of our lives are different. And so now the question is, instead of just looking at people as dollar sign, oh, you know, this gazillion trillions of dollars of wealth transfer we, we expect to see happen. Why don't we think about the people that have the wealth right now what are their concerns? What keep them up at night, right? We talk a lot about health and wealth as being integrated together, but we don't really do anything around that, do we, right? If you, look, if you talk to a lot of people that are in the 50s or even 40s or 60s, one of the biggest concern is not only would I have enough money going in my next 30, 40 years, is how is my health and my well-being going to impact how much money I have? And mm-hmm. Do I have the means to address what I will need in the future? How do you go about answering that question? Because that not only impacts the person that's getting older, it also impacts their adult children, right? And so when we start thinking about all the extensions of life's obligations, and it's a much bigger model that we need to think about, but there again, is opportunities. And and to to sort of segue into that next conversation, when, when we think about, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, the reality of not having any money and not having, you know, this egalitarian sort of utopia, that, um, that won't happen, nor will we be, like, shipping ourselves off the planet. So we have to come back to reality. Wait, I and thought we people back. were shooting themselves up in space already. <laughs> yeah, you know, the billionaires could do whatever they want. Um, but when we, when we think about, you know, the, the connectivity between this ambient banking and where we want to go, Going back to, you know, there are plenty of communities that are sort of unequal, you know, rougher parts and tougher parts and poorer parts and richer parts. And the challenge is to bring up every one of those communities because we're not going to go to this place where everybody has equal amount of credits. And so when, when we think about leveling up different communities and leveling up more people, ambient banking allows you to think about how wealth can be built over time and over generations. And so this multi-generational approach to having, you know, support of policy, support of regulation, support of benefits that provide ways for people to build savings and build wealth, 
and as a community of wealth managers, if you're not supporting regulatory changes that allow people to save early and to have employers be part of that mix and to support ways for you know, healthcare to be more affordable and these type of things, then, then we're missing an opportunity to create more customers for you and more clients for you down the road as this business model evolves. Because that's the challenge is that we're, we're not doing enough to make each community sort of a level playing field. And historically, the banking industry has not done that. So yeah. there's a lot more that we need to do in order to get this generation that much wealthier, the next generation that much wealthier. It has a lot to do with you know, work and training and these things, but it also has a lot to do with what we support personally. So that, that's what I would challenge people and your listeners to think about is, mm. what are they doing in their communities? What are they doing outside of their communities? Who are they calling government to like get people to be able to save and invest and actually change their own lives change their wealth position so that the next generation has that bigger step up. Mm. So you agree with Henry Ford, <sighs> right? If you think about it, when he, when he introduced the production line, the reason he paid such high wages at the time was his view that he was also growing a customer base, right? It, it, it was, it was, sure, you know, I'd like them to live well, but really I'd like them to be able to live well enough to afford my cars, and so he, he thought about the entire ecosystem he was in, not just his little, little part of it. And I think you know, that was pretty forward thinking. But I think what you're calling for is that the wealth management and the overall financial services industry has to be equally enlightened, right? And, and really think about the entirety of the ecosystem that they're, that they're playing in, not just the current customer segment that they're serving today. Yeah. It's, it's that enlightened self-interesting that you mentioned earlier, John. I mean, a couple of things. Number one, if you're serving multi-generations, you can actually serve clients who may be smaller, right? So if I, if I, I find a 35-year-old couple and they don't have a huge amount of money, but if I'm also able to serve their parents and maybe their grandparents if they're still alive and see, see that whole, gen, whole multi-generational family, oh, I actually am serving at a price point or, or, or at a scale that makes sense for me as a business person, as a financial advisor, but also I'm able to render better service, right? So as you're, if you move into a sandwich generation, and I'm kind of getting there, and we were talking earlier about, you know, my son's two years away from college. My parents are, they're young to be my parents, but they're, you know, 70-ish. And my wife's parents are in their mid-80s. You know, you start to get into this scenario where, oh, college is going to be a thing that I'm supporting and maybe needing to help elderly parents financially and otherwise. And if you don't have a picture of that as a, as a financial advisor, you might not be giving the best service to, to, your, to your clients, right? Like, I mean, you know, what happens if all of a sudden I have to take over all my parents' financial needs, right? Yeah. Because they don't have enough money. And I'm now supporting people that my current financial plan had no idea was coming. Right. Absolutely. That's a and and that's that is the gist of, you know, what what we've been talking about is that most of the adult children that step up as financial caregivers, they do it in a crisis because your parents, you know, fall ill or, you know, something bad happens. And all of a sudden you are looking at this mountain of financial relationships that you had no idea about that you had to spend time to sort them out. And this is like a story that we keep hearing over and over and over again because your parents, either they don't have a financial advisor or they do, they don't know you, and you have your own. And so each one of the atoms, they need to be connected to make it work. And if you can connect them, it's a much bigger pie than the little ones that you have, right? And, and your point about sandwich generation is, is, is on point, right? More and more of us are in that boat. And... The best solution to it is to be able to plan earlier. So who is helping us plan earlier? Mm, mm. I, I, would, I would ask, I guess, also, you know, if, if the wealth advisor sort of model is changing, where it's, you know, I've got 50, 100, 150 clients at most. I have an asset-based model, you know, which is going away and becoming a fiduciary model. I, I would think that players like Wealthfront and, and other large organizations, they would <clears throat> start to embed traditional banking within their wealth model 
And that's what we're seeing with sort of automated banking with Wealthfront and other providers is that they're going to start to sort of encroach on day-to-day banking and those type of needs and embed that into their sort of wealth advisory model. So how can wealth advisory platforms think about bringing in more than just a wealth relationship into the way that they create revenue and provide value and create a network or marketplace of services that actually help people with more than just the long-term savings and long-term wealth building. You know, it's, what do you, what do you do to get a first time, you know, buyer into a house? What do you do to have someone start a business? What do you do with the whole generation of people that are looking at work, you know, in four or five different jobs at a time, not just four or five careers in their lifetime, but hustling across all of these different things until something sticks for them. So there's an opportunity to really rethink how the advisor model works because you could be at the nexus of many, many more clients if you create within your company and with your set of advisors, whether it's thousands of them or you know four or five, you now have the opportunity through these technology platforms to recreate a business model that really works. Think about all the different changes in business models over the last 18 months from restaurants to retailers to wealth companies and the way that they've changed their business model. There's nothing that should stop your imagination. I love that point that they made. Mm -hmm. And I think we are seeing um, changes in reverse too. I think recently we have, we have seen, you know, Citibank and American Express and all those adding wealth management capabilities, right. To, to what they're doing now. They've been trying it for quite a few years. Um, whether or not they can make it work finally this time, you know, it, it remains to be seen. But I, I think regardless of what role you play in the ecosystem, all of us recognize that there is more opportunities to be had that we can do, that we can expand on using technology. So, so the question is, what is the smarter way to go about doing it? Hmm. So I know we're coming up, you know, uh, towards the end of our time together. So I'm going to rip through a couple of things relatively quickly, so we don't uh, uh, take you, take you too long. Uh, but we we touched only uh, mildly on on longevity as a, as a concept here, right? You know, when I was learning finance uh, back in college, you know, one of my professors says, "Hey, there's two great risks in life: dying too early." And living too long, right? <laughs> it's just like, and you know, dying too early, we buy insurance for that, you know, life insurance to cover that type of stuff. But living too long is actually a pretty big risk that's going to increase for our society. In that, you know, it, it's been estimated that you know nearly one third of uh, healthy Americans will live to a hundred, uh, which is amazing. And a few months ago, I had a gentleman. Uh, uh, who runs the Modern Elder Academy, which is this whole con construct around adulthood being longer now like we're like 30 years more of adulthood than we had at the beginning of the 20th century now uh how might our financial advisor models need to change the service people living longer and, and what opportunities are there that you see uh based on longevity first of all you do not call someone an elder unless they're older than 85 <laughs> um. <laughs> Um, and, and, but, but in an all honesty, um, I think the definition of old has been changing and, um, that what was the saying? Age is just a number that yeah. is really true. Cause if you look at all of us, right? So for example, I'm almost 50. Now, if I look back at my parents, when they were my age, they were already retiring. Actually, my mm. mother, I think she retired right before 50. For me, I don't think I'll be thinking anything about retirement until at least another 20 years because my kids are just in elementary school. And so when we think about living longer, people living longer, it's not just about living longer and you spend an extra 30 years sitting on the couch watching TV. It's how we're living is different too. We're healthier. We're out and about doing more things, doing things differently. The, um, the amount, the percentage of the highest percentage of new entrepreneurs that are starting businesses are actually those who are older than 45, right? They're not your 20 something year old, you know, from the Valley, um, or, or, you know, in, in some coastal areas, those are people with a little bit of money with a huge network 
of, of people and lived experiences and they are starting businesses. So if you're a wealth advisor and to Bradley's point, how are you supporting these people, right? That are just approaching the midpoint of their lives and starting new things, trying new things at the same time, having your, you know, kids that you need to worry about going to college, Mike, to your point, or parents, right? They're in the seventies that will eventually need your help in, in 10, 15 years time. I, I think I look at that as an opportunity, opportunity to rethink what things they will need and how you can go about serving them. And at the same time, then that means you're, if you're not retiring at 50 or 60, that means you're living longer. If you're working longer, living longer, how are you going to help people reimagine what would retirement look like, right? We're seeing more and more people who say that they are only going to do semi-retirement or some sort of hybrid retirement. I don't know what, what the right word is anymore, but people that are half retiring and still working or perhaps taking a, um, a step back in their career and doing more mentoring work, right? And so when that changes, how will their finances look like? How are you going to be able to help them draw down? That's one of the things we talk about is, if we think about decumulation of assets, much of that is still rest with a very small sliver of the population, but not those that have perhaps 100K or a little bit less. How would they be able to, to answer that very simple question, when can I stop working? That is a very simple question. I, I, I would say if I were an advisor right now, I would get involved in understanding how work is changing. Mm -hmm. And I would get involved in understanding how people in their 40s and 50s and 60s are recreating careers and restarting different ways of creating active income, not passive income. And, and the number one thing I would advise, especially since we're living longer, buy every single one of your clients an Apple Watch and get them involved in improving their health. Mm -hmm. Because what's the point of having all this wealth and having these extra years if you're not healthy? If you're not active, you know, not enjoying life, you know, I'm, I'm on this serious, like, you know, kick to get everybody healthier, because what is the point if you're not going to be able to get around and be healthy and be active? So get involved in, you know, I people's thought you lives. were going to ask people to get a Peloton. <laughs> John, yeah, maybe hey, we have an takes. affiliate link for Apple Watch into the show Peloton, notes Apple here. Watch. So. All of it. <laughs> Do just it. saying here, I'm just saying. Well, and, and I just bought a rower, you know, so if, if, if you, know, you want some, some links, let me know. <laughs> well, you know, all of this talk about living longer lives and focusing on this multi-generational future um, really brings up this idea that, Theo, you've mentioned before about sustainability and and in this case, you know, the advisors are going to need sustainable business models. And you talked about a sustainable culture. And you talked about things like diversity and inclusion around that idea of a sustainable culture. And, you know, I guess the question for our audience might be, you know, why should wealth managers focus their attention here? They feel soft, these subjects. But I think you've got a different perspective, and I think our audience would, would love to hear that. Yeah, um, just like people call things soft skills, there are critical skills and crucial skills. Um, just like when we think about ESG, it's not just about green energy, renewable energy, or you know, getting to, to net zero. It's more than that. Because for our society collectively to be sustainable, just like you say, we need to have a culture that can support everyone to be successful, right? And so, you know, beyond just sustaining our earth, let's try not to burn that down. We also need to create an environment where everyone can thrive. And, and so to do that, we need to be more conscious of who are the people that we're serving, right? Going back to what are you doing? What is your purpose in life? And for wealth management, especially looking at the change in demographics, right? Looking at the people that you're serving or trying to attract extra clients, they are different than how it was 30 years ago. They're not just all, excuse, sorry, um, in advance, not just all white dudes, like my colleagues, um, all three of you sitting in here. They are different, right? There are women that need the help, that can use the help. There are people from different ethnic backgrounds that can use the help. 
or people with mixed race, people coming from all kinds of walks of life that they can use the help to get better, to create a more sustainable financial future, right? And I think the other point with the changing in demographics is also, I think people care more about the world that they live in, right? Either be it from a cultural perspective, from a race, uh, race equality perspective, or just from having a greener planet perspective. So these are things that people do care, care more about. You start seeing even companies, um, CEOs that they come out and say, well, you know, we want to try to achieve a more uh, greener, better, equal future. And so these are not just profits, they are purpose. And so, you know, your role is to try to get both of them in and to try to serve your clients better that way. And I think your book's point is really that purpose can drive profits. Mm -hmm. They can. And we have tons of examples in the book. You know, we, we talked about Sunrise Banks, for example, in the Midwest that serve immigrants. We talk about Aspiration, that's a fintech that, um, you know, helps and uh, help people live a greener, more sustainable life. Um, and there are tons of examples, not just in the U.S., but around the world. So again, it goes back to, the tool set is there. Um, I think, you know, you have an audience that is ready and willing to get your services. Now your question is, what are you going to do about it? Love it. Well, Bradley Limer, Theo Lau, this has been a fantastic conversation. The book is Beyond Good, How Technology is Leading a Purpose-Driven Business Revolution. We're going to make sure that there is a link to the book on the show notes, there are linked to your respective LinkedIn profiles and, and, and the website. Any other place uh, you'd like people to follow up with you? Uh, you mentioned the podcast. What's, uh, what's the name of the podcast again? Podcast name is One Vision. One Vision. You can find it everywhere you listen to podcasts. And uh, for the book, you could go out along with that link to beyondgoodbook.com. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation. I think we, we left a lot on the table, so don't be surprised if we're chatting with you again on the show. Thank you both. Great fun. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to and or watching this episode of the Augmented Advisor Podcast. It's always fantastic to have you with us. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as we did. I know I say that at the end of every show, but this is one of those ones where, you know, your mind is opened a little bit more to some new concepts and it really feels good to have that conversation and just kind of feel a little smarter, a little more um, observant of some opportunities. That's the way I looked at this conversation, right? It's like, Wake me up to some opportunities for some new coolness, right? So uh, huge thanks to Theo Lau and Bradley Limer for joining us and uh, sharing all the goodness with us, okay? And by the way, props to our man, Jason Henricks. He's the one who turned us on to the book, Beyond Good. And as a result, we got to meet Theo and Bradley and kind of the rest is history, okay? By the way, lastly here, make sure you give the book a read, right? You can find it on all the uh, booksellers, as you heard, Amazon and so forth. There's a ton of fascinating goodness in there. I know, pun intended, but you can take what you learn and use it to grow your business and make a positive impact on the world in the process. So just grab the book, give it a read. You won't regret it, okay? All right. Before we let you go, two quick things. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform and follow Blue Leaf on LinkedIn. All right, real easy thing. Just go to LinkedIn, type in Blue Leaf, click the follow. That way you stay on top of all the episodes that are coming out. You can be part of the community, add your comments and questions and suggestions right there and be awesome. You'll be part of the show. You won't just be you know listening or watching. You'll be like, part of it. We would love to have you. Okay. All right. That's it for today. Make sure you're staying safe and be nice to each other. We'll see you next week on the Augmented Advisory Podcast. See ya. Bye.